or three ghosts. Then the front door opened and F. Jasmine heard her father trudging slowly down the hall. Already the moths were at the window, flattening their wings against the screen and the final kitchen afternoon was over at last. Three. Early that evening, F. Jasmine passed before the jail. She was on her way to Sugarville to have her fortune told and though the jail was not directly on the way, she had wanted to have one final look at it before she left the town forever. For the jail had scared and haunted her that spring and summer. It was an old brick jail, three stories high and surrounded by a cyclone fence topped with barbed wire. Inside were thieves, robbers, and murderers. The criminals were caged in stone cells with iron bars before the windows, and though they might beat on the stone walls or wrench at the iron bars, they could never get out. They wore striped jail clothes and ate cold peas with cockroaches cooked in them and cold cornbread. F. Jasmine knew some people who had been locked up in jail, all of them colored. A boy called Cape and a friend of Bernice's who was accused by the white lady she worked for of stealing a sweater and a pair of shoes. When you were arrested, the black Mariah screamed to your house and a crowd of policemen burst in the door to haul you off down to the jail. After she took the three-bladed knife from the Sears and Roebuck store, the jail had drawn the old Frankie. And sometimes on those late spring afternoons, she would come to the street across from the jail, a place known as Jail Widow's Walk, and stare for a long time. Often some criminals would be hanging to the bars, it seemed to her that their eyes, like the long eyes of the freaks at the fair, had called to her as though to say, we know you. Occasionally on Saturday afternoons, there would be wild yells and singing and hollering from the big cell known as the bullpen. But now, this evening, the jail was quiet. But from a lighted cell, there was one criminal, or rather the outline of his head, and his two fists around the bars. The brick jail was gloomy dark, although the yard and some cells were lighted. What are you locked up for? John Henry called. He stood a little distance from F. Jasmine, and he was wearing the jonquil dress, as F. Jasmine had given him all the costumes. She had not wished to take him with her, but he had pleaded and pleaded and finally followed at a distance anyway. When the criminal did not answer, he called again in a thin, high voice, are you going to be hung? Hush up, F. Jasmine said. The jail did not frighten her this evening, for this time tomorrow she would be far away. She gave the jail a last glance and then walked on. How would you like for somebody to holler something like that to you if you were in jail? It was past eight o'clock when she reached Sugarville. The evening was dusty and lavender. Doors of the crowded houses on either side were open, and from some parlors there was the quavered flutter of oil lamps, lighting up the front room beds and decorated mantelpieces. Voices sounded slurred, and from a distance came the jazz of a piano and horn. Children played in alleyways, leaving world footsteps in the dust. The people were dressed for Saturday night, and on a corner she passed a group of jesting colored boys and girls in shining evening dresses. There was a party air about the street that reminded her that she also could go that very evening to a date at the Blue Moon. She spoke to people on the street and felt again the unexplainable connection between her eyes and other eyes. Mixed with the bitter dust and smells of privies and supper time, the smell of a clematis vine threaded the evening air. The house where Bernice lived was on the corner of Chinaberry Street, a two-room house with a tiny front yard bordered by shards and bottle caps. A bench on the front porch held pots of cool, dark ferns. The door was only partly open, and F. Jasmine could see the gold-gray flutters of the lamplight inside. You stay out here, she said to John Henry. There was the murmuring of a strong, cracked voice behind the door, and when F. Jasmine knocked, the voice was quiet a second and then asked, Who that? Who is it? Me, she said, 
for if she answered her true name, Big Mama would not recognize it. Frankie. The room was close, although the wooden shutter stood open, and there was the smell of sickness and fish. The crowded parlor was neat. One bed stood against the right wall, and on the opposite side of the room were a sewing machine and a pump organ. Over the hearth hung a photograph of Ludy Freeman. The mantelpiece was decorated with fancy calendars, fair prizes, souvenirs. Big Mama lay in the bed against the wall next to the door, so that in the daytime she could look out through the front window onto the ferny porch and street outside. She was an old colored woman, shriveled and with bones like broomsticks. On the left side of her face and neck, the skin was the color of tallow, so that part of her face was almost white and the rest copper colored. The old Frankie used to think that Big Mama was slowly turning to a white person, but Bernice had said it was a skin disease that sometimes happens to colored people. Big Mama had done fancy washing and fluted curtains until the year the misery had stiffened her back so that she took to bed. But she had not lost any faculties. Instead, she suddenly found second sight. The old Frankie had always thought she was uncanny, and when she was a little girl, Big Mama was connected in her mind with the three ghosts who lived inside the coal house. And even now, a child no longer, she still had an eerie feeling about Big Mama. She was lying on three feathered pillows, the covers of which were bordered with crochet, and over her bony legs there was a many-colored quilt. The parlor table with the lamp was pulled up close beside the bed so that she could reach the objects on it. A dream book, a white saucer, a work basket, a jelly glass of water, a Bible, and other things. Big Mama had been talking to herself before F. Jasmine came in, as she had the constant habit of telling herself just who she was and what she was doing and what she intended to do as she lay there in the bed. There were three mirrors on the wall which reflected the wave-like light from the lamp that fluttered gold-gray in the room and cast giant shadows. The lamp wick needed trimming. Someone was walking in the back room. I came to get my fortune told, F. Jasmine said. While Big Mama talked to herself when alone, she could be very silent at other times. She stared at F. Jasmine for several seconds before she answered, Very well. Draw up that stool before the organ. F. Jasmine brought the stool close to the bed and, leaning forward, stretched out her palm. But Big Mama did not take her palm. She examined F. Jasmine's face, then spat the wad of snuff into a chamber pot which she pulled from underneath the bed, and finally put on her glasses. She waited so long that it occurred to F. Jasmine that she was trying to read her mind and this made her uneasy. The walking in the back room stopped, and there was no sound in the house. Cast back your mind and remember, she said finally. Tell me the revelation of your last dream. F. Jasmine tried to cast back her mind, but she did not dream often. Then finally she remembered a dream she had had that summer. I dreamed there was a door she said. I was just looking at it, and while I watched, it began slowly to open, and it made me feel funny, and I woke up. Was there a hand in the dream? F. Jasmine thought, I don't think so. Was there a cockroach on that door? Why, I don't think so. It signifies as follows. Big Mama slowly closed and opened her eyes. There's gonna be a change in your life. Next, she took F. Jasmine's palm and studied it for quite a while. I see here where you're gonna marry a boy with blue eyes and light hair. You will live to be your three score and ten, but you must act careful about water. I see here a red clay ditch and a bale of cotton. F. Jasmine thought to herself that there was nothing to it, only a pure waste of money and time. What does that signify? 
But suddenly the old woman raised her head, and the cords of her neck stiffened, and she called, You Satan! She was looking at the wall between the parlor and the kitchen, and F. Jasmine turned to look over her shoulder also. Yes, um, a voice replied from the back room, and it sounded like honey. How many times I gotta tell you, take them big feet off the kitchen table? Yes, um, honey said again. His voice was meek as Moses, and F. Jasmine could hear him put his feet down on the floor. Your nose is going to grow into that book, honey brown. Put it down and finish up your supper. F. Jasmine shivered. Had Big Mama looked clear through the wall and seen honey reading with his feet up on the table? Could those eyes pierce through a pure blank wall? It seemed as though it would behoove her to listen carefully to every word. I see here a sum of money. A sum of money, and I see a wedding. F. Jasmine's outstretched hand trembled a little. That, she said, tell me about that. The wedding or the money? The wedding. The lamplight made an enormous shadow of them on the bare boards of the wall. It's the wedding of a near relation. And I foresee a trip ahead. A trip? She asked, what kind of trip, a long trip? Big Mama's hands were crooked, spotted with freckly pale blots, and the palms were like melted pink birthday candles. Mm, a short trip, she said. But how? F. Jasmine began. I see a going and a coming back, a departure and a return. There was nothing to it for surely Bernice had told her about the trip to Winter Hill and the wedding. But if she could see straight through the wall, are you sure? Well, this time the old cracked voice was not so certain. I see a departure and a return, but it may not be for now. I can't guarantee, for at the same time I see roads, trains, and a sum of money. Oh, F. Jasmine said. There was the sound of footsteps, and Honey Camden Brown stood on the threshold between the kitchen and the parlor. He wore tonight a yellow shirt with a bow tie, for he was usually a natty dresser. But his dark eyes were sad, and his long face still as stone. F. Jasmine knew what Big Mama had said about Honey Brown. She said he was a boy God had not finished. The Creator had withdrawn his hand from him too soon. God had not finished him, and so he had to go around doing one thing and then another to finish himself up. When she had first heard this remark, the old Frankie did not understand the hidden meaning. Such a remark put her in mind of a peculiar half-boy, one arm, one leg, half a face, a half-person hopping in the gloomy summer sun around the corners of the town. But later, she understood it a little better. Honey played the horn and had been first in his studies at the colored high school. He ordered a French book from Atlanta and learned himself some French. At the same time, he would suddenly run hog wild all over Sugarville and tear around for several days until his friends would bring him home more dead than living. His lips could move as light as butterflies and he could talk as well as any human she had ever heard. But other times, he would answer with a collared jumble that even his own family could not follow. The creator, Big Mama said, had withdrawn his hand from him too soon, so that he was left eternally unsatisfied. Now he stood there leaning against the door jamb, bony and limp, and although the sweat showed on his face, he somehow looked cold. Do you wish anything before I go? he asked. There was something about Honey that evening that struck F. Jasmine. It was as though, on looking into his sad, still eyes, she felt she had something to say to him. His skin in the lamplight was the color of dark wisteria, and the lips were quiet and blue. Did Bernice tell you about the wedding? F. Jasmine asked. But for once, it was not about the wedding that she felt she had to speak. Ah, he answered. There's nothing I wish now. T.T.'s due here in a minute to visit with me for a while and meet up with Bernice. Where are you off to, boy? 
I'm going over to Forks Falls. Well, Mr. Up and Sudden, when you done decide that. Honey stood leaning against the door jamb, stubborn and quiet. Why can't you act like everybody else? Big Mama said. I'll just stay over through Sunday and come back Monday morning. The feeling that she had something to say to Honey Brown still troubled F. Jasmine. She said to Big Mama, You were telling me about the wedding. Yes. She was not looking at F. Jasmine's palm, but at the organdy dress and the silk hose and the new silver slippers. I told you you would marry a light-haired boy with blue eyes later on. But that's not what I'm talking about. I mean the other wedding and the trip and what you saw about the roads and the trains. Exactly, said Big Mama. But F. Jasmine had the feeling that she was no longer paying much mind to her, although she looked again at her palm. I foresee a trip with a departure and a return, and later, a sum of money, roads, and trains. Your lucky number is six, although 13 is sometimes lucky for you, too. F. Jasmine wanted to protest and argue, but how could you argue with a fortune teller? She wanted at least to understand the fortune better, for the trip with the return did not fit in with the foreseen of roads and trains. But as she was about to question further, there were footsteps on the front porch, a door knock, and Titi came into the parlor. He was very proper, scraping his feet and bringing Big Mama a carton of ice cream. Bernice had said he did not make her shiver, and it was true, he was nobody's pretty man. His stomach was like a watermelon underneath his vest, and there were rolls of fat on the back of his neck. He brought in with him the stir of company that she had always loved and envied about this two-room house. Always it had seemed to the old Frankie, when she could come here hunting Bernice, that there would be many people in the room, the family, various cousins, friends. In the wintertime, they would sit by the hearth around the drafty, shivering fire and talk with woven voices. On clear autumn nights, they were always the first to have sugar cane, and Bernice would hack the joints of the slick purple cane, and they would throw the chewed, twisted pieces marked with their teeth prints on a newspaper spread upon the floor. The lamplight gave the room a special look, a special smell. Now, with the coming of T.T., there was the old sense of company and commotion. The fortune was evidently over, and F. Jasmine put a dime in the white china saucer on the parlor table, for, although there was no fixed price, the future anxious folks who came to Big Mama usually paid what they felt due. I declare I never did see anybody grow like you do, Frankie, Big Mama remarked. What you ought to do is tie a brick bat to your head. F. Jasmine shriveled on her heels, her knees bent slightly and her shoulders hunched, that's a sweet dress you got on, and them silver shoes and silk stockings. You look like a regular grown girl. F. Jasmine and Honey left the house at the same time, and she was still fretted by the feeling that she had something to say to him. John Henry, who'd been waiting in the lane, rushed toward them, but Honey did not pick him up and swing him around as he sometimes did. There was a cold sadness about Honey this evening. The moonlight was white. What are you going to do in Forks Falls? Just mess around. Do you put any faith in those fortunes? When Honey did not answer, she went on. You remember when she hollered back to you to take your feet off the table? It gave me a shock. How did she know your feet were on the table? The mirror, Honey said. She has a mirror by the door so she can see what goes on in the kitchen. Oh, she said, I never have believed in fortunes. John Henry was holding Honey's hand and looking up into his face. What are horse powers? F. Jasmine felt the power of the wedding. It was as though on this last evening she ought to order and advise. There was something she ought to tell, Honey, a warning or some wise advice. And as she fumbled in her mind, an idea came to her. It was so new, so unexpected, that she stopped walking and stood absolutely still. I know what you ought to do. You ought to go to Cuba or Mexico. 
Honey had walked on a few steps farther, but when she spoke, he stopped also. John Henry was midway between them, and as he looked from one to the other, his face in the white moonlight had a mysterious expression. Sure enough, I'm perfectly serious. It don't do you any good to mess around between Forks Falls and this town. I've seen a whole lot of pictures of Cubans and Mexicans. They have a good time. She paused. This is what I'm trying to discuss. I don't think you'll ever be happy in this town. I think you ought to go to Cuba. You are so light-skinned, and you even have a kind of Cuban expression. You could go there and change into a Cuban. You could learn to speak the foreign language, and none of those Cubans would ever know you are a color boy. Don't you see what I mean? Honey was still as a dark statue and as silent. What? John Henry asked again. What do they look like, them horse powers? With a jerk, Honey turned and went on down the lane. It is fantastic. No, it is not. Pleased that Honey had used the word fantastic to her, she said it quietly to herself before she went on to insist. It's not a particle fantastic. You mark my words. It's the best thing you can do. But Honey only laughed and turned off at the next alley. So long. The streets in the middle of the town reminded F. Jasmine of a carnival fair. There was the same air of holiday freedom, and, as in the early morning, she felt herself a part of everything, included and gay. On a main street corner, a man was selling mechanical mice, and an armless beggar with a tin cup in his lap sat cross-legged on the sidewalk, watching. She had never seen Front Avenue at night before, for in the evening she was supposed to play in the neighborhood close to home. The warehouses across the street were black, but the square mill at the far end of the avenue was lighted in all its many windows, and there was a faint mill humming and the smell of dying bats. Most of the businesses were open, and the neon signs made a mingling of varied lights that gave to the avenue a watery look. There were soldiers on corners and other soldiers strolling along with grown date girls. The sounds were slurred late summer sounds, footsteps, laughter, and above the shuffled noises, the voices of someone calling from an upper story down into the summer street. The building smelled of sun-baked brick and the sidewalk was warm beneath the soles of her new silver shoes. F. Jasmine stopped on the corner across from the blue moon it seemed a long time since that morning when she had joined up with the soldier. The long kitchen afternoon had come between, and the soldier had somehow faded. The date that afternoon had seemed so very far away, and now that it was almost nine o'clock, she hesitated. She had the unexplainable feeling that there was a mistake. Where are we going? John Henry asked. I think it's high time we went home. His voice startled her, as she had almost forgotten him. He stood there with his knees locked, big-eyed and trappled in the old tarlatan costume. I have business in town. You go home. He stared up at her and took the bubble gum he had been chewing from his mouth. He tried to park the gum behind his ear, but sweat had made his ear too slippery. So finally, he put the gum back in his mouth again. You know the way home as well as I do, so do what I tell you. For a wonder, John Henry minded her, but as she watched him going away from her down the crowded street, she felt a hollow sorriness. He looked so babyish and pitiful in the costume. The change from the street to the inside of the blue moon was like the change that comes on leaving the open fairway and entering a booth. Blue lights and moving faces, noise. The counter and tables were crowded with soldiers and men and bright-faced ladies. The soldier she had promised to meet was playing the slot machine in a far corner, putting in nickel after nickel, but winning none. Oh, it's you, he said when he noticed her standing at his elbow. For a second, his eyes had the blank look of eyes that are peering back into the brain to recollect but only for a second. I was scared you'd stood me up. After putting in a final nickel, 
He banged the slot machine with his fist. Let's find a place. They sat at a table between the counter and the slot machine, and though by the clock the time was not long, it seemed to F. Jasmine endless. Not that the soldier was not nice to her. He was nice, but their two conversations would not join together, and underneath there was a layer of queerness she could not place and understand. The soldier had washed, and his swollen face, his ears, and hands were clean. His red hair was darkened from wetting and ridged with a comb. He said he had slept that afternoon. He was gay, and his talk was sassy. But although she liked gay people and sassy talk, she could not think of any answers. It was again as though the soldier talked a kind of double talk that, try as she would, she could not follow. Yet it was not so much the actual remarks as the tone underneath she failed to understand. The soldier brought two drinks to the table. After a swallow, F. Jasmine suspected there was liquor in them, and although a child no longer, she was shocked. It was a sin and against the law for people under 18 to drink real liquor, and she pushed the glass away. The soldier was both nice and gay, but after he had had two other drinks, she wondered if he could be drunk. To make conversation, she remarked that her brother had been swimming in Alaska, but this did not seem to impress him very much. Nor would he talk about the war, nor foreign countries and the world. To his joking remarks, she could never find replies that fitted, although she tried. Like a nightmare pupil in a recital who has to play a duet to a piece she does not know, F. Jasmine did her best to catch the tune and follow, but soon she broke down and grinned until her mouth felt wooden. The blue lights in the crowded room, the smoke and noisy commotion confused her also. You're a funny kind of girl, the soldier said finally. Patton, she said, I bet he will win the war in two weeks. The soldier was quiet now, and his face had a heavy look. His eyes gazed at her with the same strange expression she had noticed that day at noon, a look she had never seen on anyone before and could not place. After a while, he said, and his voice was soft and blurred, What did you say your name is, beautiful? F. Jasmine did not know whether or not to like the way he called her, and she spoke her name in a proper voice. Well, Jasmine, how about going upstairs? His tone was asking, but when she did not answer at once, he stood up from the table. I've got a room here. Why, I thought we were going to the idle hour or dancing or something. What's the rush? He said. The band don't hardly tune up until 11 o'clock. F. Jasmine did not want to go upstairs, but she did not know how to refuse. It was like going into a fair booth or fair ride that once having entered, you cannot leave until the exhibition or the ride is finished. Now it was the same with the soldier, this date. She could not leave until it ended. The soldier was waiting at the foot of the stairs, and, unable to refuse, she followed after him. They went up two flights and then along a narrow hall that smelled of wee-wee and linoleum. But every footstep F. Jasmine took, she felt somehow was wrong. This sure is a funny hotel, she said. It was the silence in the hotel room that warned and frightened her, a silence she noticed as soon as the door was closed. In the light of the bare electric bulb that hung down from the ceiling, the room looked hard and very ugly. The flaked iron bed had been slept in, and a suitcase of jumbled soldier's clothes lay open in the middle of the floor. On the light oak bureau, there was a glass pitcher full of water and a half-eaten package of cinnamon rolls covered with blue-white icing and fat flies. The screenless window was open, and the sleazy boil curtains had been tied at the top in a knot together to let in air. There was a lavatory in the corner, and cupping his hands, the soldier dashed cold water to his face. The soap was only a bar of ordinary soap already used, and over the lavatory a sign read, Strictly Washing. 
Although the soldier's footsteps sounded and the water made a trickling noise, the sense of silence somehow remained. F. Jasmine went to the window, which overlooked a narrow alley and a brick wall. A rickety fire escape led to the ground and light shafted from the two lower stories. Outside, there was the August evening sounds of voices and a radio, and in the room there were sounds also. So how could the silence be explained? The soldier sat on the bed, and now she was seeing him altogether as a single person, not as a member of the loud free gangs who for a season roamed the streets of town and then went out into the world together. In the silent room, he seemed to her unjoined and ugly. She could not see him any more in Burma, Africa, or Iceland, or even for that matter in Arkansas. She saw him only as he sat there in the room. His light blue eyes, set close together, were staring at her with a peculiar look, with a filmed softness, like eyes that have been washed with milk. The silence in the room was like that silence in the kitchen when on a drowsy afternoon the ticking of the clock would stop and there would steal over her a mysterious uneasiness that lasted until she realized what was wrong. A few times before she had known such silence. Once in the Sears and Robot store the moment before she suddenly became a thief and again that April afternoon in the McKean's garage. It was the forewarning hush that comes before an unknown trouble. A silence caused not by lack of sounds, but by a waiting, a suspense. The soldier did not take those strange eyes from her, and she was scared. Come on, Jasmine, he said in an unnatural voice, broken and low, as he reached out his hand, palm upward toward her. Let's quit this stalling. The next minute was like a minute in the fair crazy house or real Milledgeville. Already, F. Jasmine had started for the door, for she could no longer stand the silence. But as she passed the soldier, he grasped her skirt and, limping by fright, she was pulled down beside him on the bed. The next minute happened, but it was too crazy to be realized. She felt his arms around her and smelled his sweaty shirt. He was not rough, but it was crazier than if he had been rough, and in a second she was paralyzed by horror. She could not push away, but she bit down with all her might upon what must have been the crazy soldier's tongue, so that he screamed out and she was free. Then he was coming toward her with an amazed, pained face, and her hand reached the glass pitcher and brought it down upon his head. He swayed a second, then slowly his legs began to crumple, and slowly he sank, sprawling to the floor. The sound was hollow like the hammer on a coconut, and with it the silence was broken at last. He lay there still, with the amazed expression on his freckled face that was now pale, and a froth of blood showed on his mouth. But his head was not broken or even cracked, and whether he was dead or not, she did not know. The silence was over, and it was like those kitchen times when, after the first uncanny moment, she realized the reason for her uneasiness and knew that the ticking of the clock had stopped. But now there was no clock to shake and hold for a minute to her ear before she wound it, feeling relieved. There slanted across her mind twisted remembrances of a common fit in the front room, basement remarks, and nasty Barney. But she did not let these separate glimpses fall together, and the word she repeated was, crazy. There was water on the walls which had been slung out from the pitcher, and the soldier had a broken look in the strewn room. F. Jasmine told herself, get out. And after first starting toward the door, she turned and climbed out on the fire escape and quickly reached the alley ground. She ran like a chaste person, fleeing from the crazy house at Milledgeville, looking neither to the right nor left. And when she reached the corner of her own home block, she was glad to see John Henry West. He was out looking for bats around the streetlight, and the familiar sight of him calmed her a little. Uncle Royal has been calling you, he said. What makes you shake like that for Frankie? 
just now brained the crazy man, she told him when she could get her breath. I brained him, and I don't know if he is dead. He was a crazy man. John Henry stared without surprise. How did he act like? And when she did not answer all at once, he went on, did he crawl on the ground and moan and slobber? For that was what the old Frankie had done one day to try to fool Bernice and create some excitement. Bernice had not been fooled. Did he? No, F. Jasmine said. He, but as she looked into those cold child eyes, she knew that she could not explain. John Henry would not understand, and his green eyes gave her a funny feeling. Sometimes his mind was like the pictures he drew with crayons on tablet paper. The other day he had drawn such a one and showed it to her. It was a picture of a telephone man on a telephone pole. The telephone man was leaning against his safety belt, and the picture was complete down to his climbing shoes. It was a careful picture, but after she had looked at it, uneasiness had lingered in her mind. She looked at the picture again until she realized what was wrong. The telephone man was drawn in side view profile, yet this profile had two eyes, one eye just above the nose bridge and another drawn just below. And it was no hurried mistake. Both eyes had careful lashes, pupils, and lids. Those two eyes drawn in a side view face gave her a funny feeling. But reason with John Henry, argue with him, you might as well argue with cement. Why did he do it? Why? Because it was a telephone man. What? Because he was climbing the pole. It was impossible to understand his point of view, and he did not understand her either. Forget what I just now told you, she said. But after saying it, she realized that was the worst remark she could have said, for he would be sure not to forget. So she took him by the shoulders and shook him slightly. Swear you won't tell? Swear this. If I tell, I hope God will sew up my mouth and sew down my eyes and cut off my ears with the scissors. But John Henry would not swear. He only hunched his big head down near his shoulders and answered very quietly, Shoo. She tried again. If you tell anybody, I might be put in jail and we couldn't go to the wedding. I ain't going to tell, John Henry said. Sometimes he could be trusted, and other times not. I'm not a tattletale. Once inside the house, F. Jasmine locked the front door before she went into the living room. Her father was reading the evening paper in his sock feet on the sofa. F. Jasmine was glad to have her father between her and the front door. She was afraid of the black Mariah and listened anxiously. I wish we were going to the wedding right this minute, she said. I think that would be the best thing to do. She went back to the icebox and ate six tablespoons of sweetened condensed milk, and the disgust in her mouth began to go away. The waiting made her feel restless. She gathered up the library books and stacked them on the living room table. On one of them, a book from the grown sections which she had not read, she wrote in the front with pencil, if you want to read something that will shock you, turn to page 66. On page 66, she wrote, Electricity, ha ha. By and by, her anxiousness was eased. Close to her father, she felt less afraid. These books belong to go back to the library. Her father, who was 41, looked at the clock. It's time for everybody under 41 to get to bed. Quick, march. And without any argument, we have to be up at five o'clock. F. Jasmine stood in the doorway, unable to leave. Papa, she said after a minute, if somebody hits somebody with a glass pitcher and he falls out cold, do you think he's dead? She had to repeat the question, feeling a bitter grudge against him because he did not take her seriously so that her questions must be asked twice. Why, come to think of it, I never hit anybody with a pitcher, he said. Did you? F. Jasmine knew he asked this as a joke, 
so she only said as she went away, I'll never be so glad to get to any place in all my life as Winter Hill tomorrow. I will be so thankful when the wedding is over and we have gone away. I will be so thankful. Upstairs, she and John Henry undressed, and after the motor and the light were off, they lay down on the bed together, although she said she could not sleep a wink. But nevertheless, she closed her eyes, and when she opened them again, a voice was calling, and the room was early gray. Part Three She said, Farewell, old ugly house. As wearing a dotted Swiss dress and carrying the suitcase, she passed through the hall at quarter to six. The wedding dress was in the suitcase, ready to be put on when she reached Winter Hill. At that still hour, the sky was the dim silver of a mirror, and beneath it, the gray town looked not like a real town, but like an exact reflection of itself. And to this unreal town, she also said farewell. The bus left the station at ten past six, and she sat proud like an accustomed traveler, apart from her father, John Henry, and Bernice. But after a while, a serious doubt came in her, which even the answers of the bus driver could not quite satisfy. They were supposed to be traveling north, but it seemed to her rather that the bus was going south instead. The sky turned burning pale, and the day blazed. They passed the fields of windless corn that had a blue look in the glare red-furrowed cotton land, stretches of black pine woods, and mile by mile the countryside became more southern. The towns they passed, New City, Leeville, Chihaw, each town seemed smaller than the one before, until at nine o'clock they reached the ugliest place of all, where they changed buses, called Flowering Branch. Despite its name, there were no flowers and no branch, only a solitary country store with a sad old shredded circus poster on the clapboard wall and a chinaberry tree beneath which stood an empty wagon and a sleeping mule. There they waited for the bus to sweep well, and, still doubting anxiously, Frances did not despise the box of lunch that had so shamed her at the first, because it made them look like family people who do not travel much. The bus left at ten o'clock, and they were in Sweetwell by eleven. The next hours were unexplainable. The wedding was like a dream, for all that came about occurred in a world beyond her power, from the moment when, sedate and proper, she shook hands with the grown people until the time, the wrecked wedding over, when she watched the car with the two of them driving away from her and flinging herself down in the sizzling dust, she cried out for the last time, Take me! Take me! From the beginning to the end, the wedding was unmanaged as a nightmare. By mid-afternoon, it was all finished, and the return bus left at four o'clock. The show is over and the monkey's dead, John Henry quoted, as he settled himself in the next to the last bus seat beside her father. Now we go home and go to bed. Frances wanted the whole world to die. She sat on the back seat between the window and Bernice, and although she was no longer sobbing, the tears were like two little brooks, and also her nose ran water. Her shoulders were hunched over her swollen heart, and she no longer wore the wedding dress. She was sitting next to Bernice, back with the colored people, and when she thought of it, she used the mean word she had never used before, nigger. For now she hated everyone and wanted only to spite and shame. For John Henry West, the wedding had only been a great big show, and he had enjoyed her misery at the end as he had enjoyed the angel cake. She mortally despised him, dressed in his best white suit, now stained with strawberry ice cream. Bernice she hated also, for to her, it had only meant a pleasure trip to Winter Hill. Her father, who had said that he would attend to her when they got home, she would like to kill. She was against every single person, even strangers in the crowded bus, 
though she only saw them blurred by tears, and she wished the bus would fall in a river or run into a train. Herself, she hated the worst of all, and she wanted the whole world to die. Cheer up, said Bernice. Wipe your face and blow your nose, and things will look better by and by. Bernice had a blue party handkerchief to match her best blue dress and blue kid shoes, and this she offered to Frances, although it was made of fine Georgette and not, of course, due to be blown on. She would not notice it. In the seat between them, there were three wet handkerchiefs of her father's, and Bernice began to dry the tears with one. But Frances did not move or budge. They put old Frankie out of the wedding. John Henry's big head bobbed over the back of his seat, smiling and snaggle-toothed. Her father cleared his throat and said, That's sufficient, John Henry. Leave Frankie alone. And Bernice added, Sit down in that seat now and behave. The bus rode for a long time, and now direction made no difference to her. She did not care. From the beginning, the wedding had been queer like the card games in the kitchen the first week last June. In those bridge games, they played and played for many days, but nobody ever drew a good hand. The cards were all sorry and no high bids made, until finally Bernice suspicioned, saying, let us get busy and count these old cards. And they got busy and counted the old cards, and it turned out the jacks and the queens were missing. John Henry at last admitted that he had cut out the jacks and then the queens to keep them company, and after hiding the clip scraps in the stove, had secretly taken the pictures home. So the fault of the card game was discovered. But how could the failure of the wedding be explained? The wedding was all wrong, although she could not point out single faults. The house was a neat brick house out near the limits of the small baked town, and when she first put foot inside, it was as though her eyeballs had been slightly stirred. There were mixed impressions of pink roses, the smell of floor wax, mints and nuts and silver trays. Everybody was lovely to her. Mrs. Williams wore a lace dress, and she asked F. Jasmine two times what grade she was in at school but she asked also if she would like to play out on the swing before the wedding in the tone grown people use when speaking to a child. Mr. Williams was nice to her, too. He was a sallow man with folds in his cheeks, and the skin beneath his eyes was the grain and color of an old apple core. Mr. Williams also asked her what grade she was in at school. In fact, that was the main question asked her at the wedding. She wanted to speak to her brother and the bride to talk to them and tell them of her plans, the three of them alone together. But they were never once alone. Jarvis was out checking the car someone was lending for the honeymoon, while Janice dressed in the front bedroom among a crowd of beautiful grown girls. She wandered from one to the other of them, unable to explain. At once, Janice put her arms around her and said she was so glad to have a little sister. And when Janice kissed her, F. Jasmine felt an aching in her throat and could not speak. Jarvis, when she went to find him in the yard, lifted her up in a roughhouse way and said, Frankie, the lanky, the alaga Frankie, the tea-legged, toe-legged, bow-legged Frankie. And he gave her a dollar. She stood in the corner of the bride's room wanting to say, I love the two of you so much, and you are the we of me. Please take me with you from the wedding, for we belong together. Or even if she could have said, May I trouble you to step into the next room as I have something to reveal to you and Jarvis? And get the three of them in a room alone together and somehow manage to explain. If only she had written it down on the typewriter in advance so that she could hand it to them and they would read. But this she had not thought to do, and her tongue was heavy in her mouth and dumb. She could only speak in a voice that shook a little to ask where was the veil. I can feel in the atmosphere a storm is brewing, said Bernice. These two crooked joints can always tell. There was no veil except a little veil that came down from the wedding hat, and nobody was wearing fancy clothes. The bride was wearing a daytime suit, 
The only mercy of it was that she had not worn her wedding dress on the bus, as she had first intended, and found it out in time. She stood in a corner of the bride's room until the piano played the first notes of the wedding march. They were all lovely to her at Winter Hill, except that they called her Frankie and treated her too young. It was so unlike what she had expected, and, as in those June card games, there was, from first to last, the sense of something terribly gone wrong. Perk up, said Bernice. I'm planning a big surprise for you. I'm just sitting here planning. Do you want to know what it is? Frances did not answer even by a glance. The wedding was like a dream outside her own power or like a show unmanaged by her in which she was supposed to have no part. The living room was crowded with Winter Hill company, and the bride and her brother stood before the mantelpiece at the end of the room. And seeing them again together was more like singing feeling than a picture that her dizzied eyes could truly see. She watched them with her heart, but all the time she was only thinking, I have not told them and they don't know and knowing this was heavy as a swallowed stone. And afterward, during the kissing of the bride, refreshments served in the dining room, the stir and party bustle. She hovered close to the two of them, but words would not come. They're not going to take me, she was thinking, and this was the one thought she could not bear. When Mr. Williams brought their bags, she hastened after with her own suitcase. The rest was like some nightmare show in which a wild girl in the audience breaks onto the stage to take upon herself an unplanned part that was never written or meant to be. You are the we of me, her heart was saying, but she could only say aloud, take me. And they pleaded and begged with her, but she was already in the car.